Welcome to Innovation and Leadership. This is part two of our episode with Craig Hatkoff. Start addressing the, the, the real issues ahead of us. I mean, there's been a lot of, in the last, um, you know, particularly in the last month, whether it was the, you know, NFL issues or what happened with uh, Confederate statues, we, we tend to get very easily distracted by the, you know, a little bit of the reality TV component. This is another episode of Innovation and Leadership, where we interview all kinds of high achievers, from world-class musicians to CEOs, authors, and pro athletes. Try to find the common elements of success, no matter what you're working on. We've got a new book coming out soon. If you want to get an advanced copy for free, please email me, jess at innovationandleadership.com, and just tell me in the email. Again, jess, J-E-S-S, at innovationandleadership.com. And now onto the episode. Uh, Craig, you know, you've got such a fascinating background, and I think we, we definitely need to get, get you back on the show to talk about some more of these things. But, um, you know, there are a number of awards out there, and, you know, with Clayton Christensen being named to the, you know, the, the number one spot in the Thinker 50, you know, for four years running, I mean, disruption, this is, this is a thing that a lot of people are getting on. Um, tell me what's different about the Disrupt Awards, or tell me what you wanted to accomplish that was special. Well, I think, you know, even in, in uh, Clayton's mind, the term disruptive innovation has become very, uh, I mean, he just used the phrase overused and it <laughs> different things to different people. So, you know, people use the word disruption. People were, use the word innovation. People tend to overuse the word disruptive innovation. Um, but the whole notion of disruption, which is broader than the specific theory, um, really is a juxtaposition about change management. I mean, that's really what we are talking about. Um, and there's a lot of innovation that, you know, you'll probably know the phrase uh, incremental innovation um, or sustaining innovation, I think, in Clay's words, which tends to be less monumental, radical, and epic. And I think, you know, what was interesting about taking Clay's body of work, which was very much, a, you know, let's call it a Silicon Valley centric um, manifesto. So I rarely have met anybody from the tech space on the West case, West Coast that either doesn't have Innovator's Dilemma, Clay's original book, either sitting on their desk or it was very influential in their thinking. Um, you know, I think Clayton's background, um, it was, uh, if you do some research on Steve Jobs, it was really the only business book that he really ever read and thought, uh, you know, that, that influenced him. So even, uh, you know, from Steve Jobs to uh, Andy Grove at Intel. So when we started the awards, I mean, we had a very large following, but it was very specific in what I'll call the traditional sense of disruptive innovation, focusing more on the technology. I think what our big take with Clay has been uh, through our the awards and our ongoing uh, dialogue uh, has been the notion that, and in Clay's words, I think we have to sp start spending more time on understanding the human element or what we'll call the cultural side versus just the pure technology. So technology, if you think of it as like a upward sloping hockey stick is changing in real time uh, and is very, very, I don't want to use the word destabilizing. And I don't want to use, consciously don't want to use the word disruptive. But there's so much change going on, and at the societal level, both macro and micro, we're struggling to understand the cultural dimensions, the ethical dimensions. So if I had to narrow it down into a, a phrase, what we're really trying to do is narrow the techno-cultural divide. And it's that gap between the rate of technological change and our ability at all different levels, whether it's global or local, to embrace and understand what we're doing uh, with these new technologies is an area that we focus on with the awards. So it's that messy space between the uh, rate of increase in technology and our uh, evolution as, uh, you know, all different aspects, whether it's tribal or global. Uh, how do we process these new changes? What example, what is the real impact of social media on today's, let's call it, whether it's the millennials or whether it's, you know, Gen X, Gen Y, what does it even mean? Are we rewiring our brains? 
And so we think that, uh, you know, truly successful innovation, um, you can have the greatest technology in the world, but if the culture doesn't really embrace it, uh, we're going to have some serious issues. One, you know, one very specific example, the technological capacity of nuclear energy is more than enough energy to power the entire universe. When you go to the cultural, political, and social elements of nuclear anything, there's a real challenge. And so that's what we would call, um, you know, that's the cultural constraint versus the technology, which is the most powerful technology in the world. And in today's world, we're experiencing sort of a, uh, a whole new element of, uh, you know, global concern uh, with our friend in North Korea. And so how do you even think about these things? Uh, we are actually in two weeks, I'll just mention one of our first uh, forays outside of the film festival. We're doing an event in Hiroshima, uh, the Disruptor Awards, that will focus on the resilience, the rebuilding, and the rebirth um, after the bomb was dropped in Japan. So we're headed over to Hiroshima uh, just about two weeks from today. Oh, that's exciting. Um, what do you feel like, you know, w doing such high profile things, you know, starting Tribeca Film Festival with Robert De Niro, you know, real estate with billionaire Sanzel. I mean, like you've done so many interesting things. You know, th I know that um, you've had a lot of interactions with the media. You have your own media companies. What do you feel like people don't ask you that that you wish they would? Or, or what what were you more interested to talk about than sometimes people are asking you about? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I think let, let's let's step back for a second and look at the overall landscape. We are clearly moving into uh, you know, epic changes in journalism and communications and entertainment. And I think, you know, there's clearly a push towards, you know, if I said to you, I'd like to do a, a one hour discussion about a particular thing um, that's very different than a two-minute video. And, you know, when you get into longer form, more immersive kinds of uh, experiences and ideas, how do you break through the clutter? So this is kind of the classic noise versus signal. Um, and, I, and I think that if I had to say, you know, what's the biggest challenge is there are many, many things that I think are really important. I, I'm going to use Facebook as an example. When, when I put something that to me is an incredibly interesting opportunity and I put in a, an article, a link to an article that requires someone to, you know, spend an extra five minutes reading, I have certain people that will follow that. But if I go into my animal, uh, put my animal hat on, if I start putting up pictures of, uh, you know, cute animals or animals in distress, there's a huge following. So I think just in general, how do you, you know, we're all fighting for attention. And, you know, my, my concern is are we oversimplifying things and being too superficial? So, you know, if you look at what's happened, whether it's the New York Times, the Washington Post, you know, even Fox News, you know, Donald Trump for the news industry is probably, forget whatever your you know, political assessment is, he's been good for business. In fact, I think that was one of the less Moonves quotes because I'm not sure Donald Trump's good for America, but he's very good for CBS. So I think there's this whole notion of um, how do we start addressing the, the, the real issues ahead of us? I mean, there's been a lot of, in the last, um, you know, particularly in the last month, whether it was the, you know, NFL issues or what happened with uh, Confederate statues, we, we tend to get very easily distracted by the, you know, a little bit of the, reality TV component of, you know, even what's happening, not just in politics, but, you know, writ large. So I think we have to kind of get over this. The world is a complicated place, and we're not very good at handling contradictions, uh, paradoxes, and inconsistencies. We tend to go, we want it all black or all white. And what we would hope that through our efforts at the Disruptor Foundation and the awards, is that we learn to look at things that are not so straightforward. So we, you know, we're looking at those gray areas. Uh, you know, one thing, you know, I will mention, we've written a series of papers. Uh, this is with Erwin Kula, the eighth generation rabbi, uh, Clayton and myself. 
we started a platform called the Off White Papers, <laughs> as opposed to White Papers. And if you go to offwhitepapers.com, uh, there are two pretty interesting uh, pieces that we, uh, uh, we co-authored with Clay. Uh, one is just on the future of disruptive innovation, some of the insights into, uh, you know, particularly Clay's thinking about where innovation is headed. Um, and another one, we did a piece uh, uh, on uh, religion called Disrupting Hell, Accountability for the Non-Believer. And, you know, what, is it, what does it even mean if you start looking at uh, the role of religion in today's society? Uh, you know, people under, let's just call it from millennials, millennials on down, um, religion is becoming less and less central. But that's a very different statement than about the spiritual yearnings that people still have. So traditional religion is... Uh, you know, has its challenges, and we really talk about that in great, uh, in great depth in our piece called "Disrupting Hell." Yeah. So, um, thinking about that idea, what advice would you have for the rest of us if we, you know, and this is probably a great place to to end the episode, but thinking about um, any of the rest of us that that want to follow your lead there and and help dig into the nuances and. And, uh, you know, this longer form, more thoughtful, less, you know, clickbaity type of approach. What advice would you have for the rest of us? Well, I think there's a, there's a number of things. One, um, there's a quote that you probably have heard some version of it, which is perfection is the enemy of the good, which is when you're whatever it is you're going to do, if you wait until it's perfect, um, you'll just never get to market, whatever your definition of bringing to market might be. And putting things out there that are still, um, you know, in the rapid prototype and it's not perfect, that takes, you know, that's, a, that's something you have to work at. Um, you know, we talk about the role of failure. I, I actually gave a commencement address um, at uh, NYU, at the Stern School, and I think the title was something like The Greatest Flops in History. And the focus, just as an example, was a fellow by the name of Dick Fosbury, uh, an Olympian from the uh, 1968 Olympics, who completely upended the field of high jumping back in 1968 during the Mexico City Olympics, where he jumped over the high bar backwards to the amazement of everyone sitting watching on television and in the arena down in Mexico City. And while he was at first... Uh, criticized and ridiculed. Today, 100% of all world-class high jumpers use what's known as the Fosbury flop. So we consider that one of the great flops uh, in history. And use that as a, don't be afraid of your failures. I mean, it's painful, um, but every failure leads to something. And I think there's a psychological barrier of, you know, even thinking about what is a failure. I mean, if you look at Steve Jobs, he had, you know, depending on how you want to characterize, four or five major, major flops during his career, but that never stopped him. So I'd say you have to have resilience, you have to have grit, uh, persistence, curiosity, and passion, and those you can cultivate. Um, but I guess the one thing is don't, you have to get used, I use the expression, I've gotten comfortable with being uncomfortable. And being uncomfortable is not the easiest emotional uh, set to deal with, but that's part of this is you're just never going to be in your comfort zone in these, you know, in these epic kind of uh, innovations and uh, changes. So when you think about someone like an Elon Musk and what he's done across multiple industries, he comes across as very self-assured, but oh my God, what, you know, what's really going on in uh, these industries? But he has definitely mastered, uh, he's not thrown off balance by all of the unknowns and the uncertainties. So I think it's really stick with it. Um, it's very hard to get excited about something in a domain that you're not particularly interested in. So uh, there's a great quote from one of our honorees, uh, Eric Raymond, we wrote a book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which I encourage everybody to at least Google, even if you don't read the book. Um, but one of his quotes is, if you want to solve an interesting problem, find a problem that interests you. So there are a lot of interesting problems out there that just aren't particularly 
interesting to me. That doesn't mean they're not important, but I would you do better when you find someone who's got a real passion. So I think that's one of the big lessons. Find something you love to do. I love it. Well, I think that's a great place to end the episode. We appreciate you spending so much time with us here today. Well, that's it for the episode. One other thing I wanted to tell you about, if you'll remember the guys from Convoy uh, in episodes back, Ken Free and Trent Mano, I went on one of their CEO trips to New York and I met a guy named Brent Thompson, very successful entrepreneur. He was former CEO of Jive Communications, big uh, company now, I think three or $400 million. Anyways, he, uh, he started a new company called blipbillboards.com. I'm super stoked they're a sponsor now. But I, I remember a year and some ago when I met him, I thought it was genius. Instead of having to buy six months or a year's worth of billboard uh, for thousands of dollars, you can buy eight seconds at a time for like 10 or 20 cents. You pick what billboard you want it on, what time of day you want it to run, and it just puts so much power in the hands of, of marketers and CEOs who want to try something and see if it works. You can buy as many or as few as you want, change it as many times as you want. Uh, I think now our podcast is being advertised on billboards in like 18 different states because we have these guys as sponsors. We're pretty excited about it. Hope you check out blipbillboards.com. Thanks.